Um, yeah, essence, I think the, the camera, the low light was the deciding factor, but then like using it has been so freaking nice. But I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the stream. Um, but uh, in Iceland, we were shooting this pretty complicated project where like everything is uh, a commercial that's a dock and we have a very limited time so i thought that using a camera that light sensitive has all that like all the good stuff that the pocket has was a good choice and by coming back and looking at the material that i've been doing today i can say that i was right it's a fantastic camera if you shoot on the right iso settings uh, so it's been pretty amazing to see how well it's held up because i think that it looks cleaner and better than the Ursa uh, but I also think that a major thing with it is that you get this look out of the grain that is very similar to what you get out of celluloid so if you want to create a look you can actually push the material I think and shoot at for instance 3200 ISO to achieve a look uh, but more on that uh, as we move along uh, but some practical things like based on our trip in Iceland that I wanted to touch uh, upon which is like pretty basic stuff I think uh, but I think the the essence that this all comes down to when you talk about uh, like what you need for a shoot if you want to make it successful is first of all to choose the right camera for the right job uh, in our case like we could have chosen to shoot the project with the Ursa, we could have chosen to shoot it with other cameras, but we chose the pocket cinema camera because of the light sensitivity and the clean image. And also I wanted to use XLR inputs on the camera so that we don't have to sync if we don't need to because uh, we have quick turnarounds and especially because we need translation straight away because it's in Icelandic. So for me to do like all the syncing and all that for all those scenes that takes a lot of time compared to just like cutting it down really quickly sending it off and then getting it back translated and and then starting to work uh, on the project so using it i pretty much like thought that i wouldn't use it above 2000 iso but when i started like looking at the space that I was in which was a truck and I was shooting and and it was dark and it was night and I'm just like 2000 is not gonna cut it I need to push it to 3200 ISO and then I realized when I got back like I had already done a lot of tests so I know knew that it would be decent but when I got back I really know this the grain structure of the pocket cinema 4k that it's really amazing how it holds up because it has all the details like in the grain you actually are able to create a look or even do like it's very similar to how I would see like super 16 like that look that you get out of that when you have it a little bit grainy that's pretty much what you get at 3200 ISO yeah. and it's a nice look because it doesn't fall apart it's not like you lack details because you have the noise that you get out of like cheap cameras or even the Ursa it falls apart pretty easily when you're shooting like low light stuff yeah. so that's a super awesome character but choosing the right camera for the right job is essential when you do a shoot yeah. and that's something that we really saw on, on this project uh, but also like having the right clothes for a project like this. So we were coming there and we stepped off the plane and our driver, he, he just told us straight away that put on your clothes, uh, dress like you will be stuck on the highway uh, in a snowstorm. And we were just like, yeah, right. He's like over exaggerating a bit. And then he told us later that the reason why he thinks this is important is because one of his friends almost died because they crashed and then couldn't get out of the car, couldn't move and was stuck there for hours waiting for like help to come. Uh, and then they were dressed right and that's what saved them. So dress for the occasion doesn't have to be that extreme maybe, but still like it, it does matter what you uh, wear on a shoot. And if you want to do like something that is in an extreme environment then it 
really matters. Like you really need to think long and hard about what you're doing, I think. Um, but yeah, that's just one uh, one thing. Um, OJ the Shooter asks, or no, what's up Johnny? You say, okay, what's up? Um, but Ditlev Eller asks, show us pictures of your trip, please. I would like to, but I can't. I can show you behind the scenes when we've gotten all this together, but I can't show you until like the campaign is live. And that's the, the crap with commercial stuff. Like, you can't show it until it's out. And these like films, they won't be out. They're going to be ready now in January, but they're not going to be out until like the Q3 of 2019. That's how long our like project runtime is or whatever it's pretty crazy how like you have to fit into a schedule of the brands but we can't do much about it and then after that we have like a couple of months before we can actually show like behind the scenes stuff and that's the type of contract we sign um, yeah but I can still show some stuff but I can't show stuff that shows the campaign or or what the stuff is that we shoot or the brand I guess even but anyways, um, another important thing that like became really obvious for us when we were out shooting was that you really need to adapt to the story. Because we got there and I was sitting in the car hearing the driver, which was like sort of our location manager, fixer type all in all uh, one person. And he was talking to the driver that we were following there. And I overheard them talking about like yeah it sounded like she was in uh, Reykjavik where we landed and and uh, I was just like okay thinking for myself okay but I'm gonna drive now for like four to six hours in this car that I'm sitting in I can either do that and like yeah sit rest have fun talk to my friends whatever but then I was just like but that doesn't make sense we're only here for like three days we need to make more out of it if we can. And she was apparently there in Reykjavik and I was just like, okay, let's just see if we can just get on to that truck that we were shooting. Uh, so they asked if I could just come aboard. She waited for us, even though there was a snowstorm and she was late and she'd been, she'd been driving all day. It's like a big thing to ask. But she waited and then I just jumped into that car. I had nothing prepared, like everything was in components in terms of the gear. I just brought the Ronin S and I brought the pocket cinema camera in, in two bags. That was all I had. I had to rig everything up in the truck in darkness. I had a small flashlight, that, like a loom cube to kind of see what I was doing. It was totally chaos and I had no control of the situation. I just had to go with it. And I just felt like that was worthwhile because I didn't know exactly what would happen. But I also felt like just being in a truck stuck with the main character was worthwhile for, you know, those 12 hours that we were pretty much in that truck um, and just getting to know the person. But out of that came like this amazing scene that's one of the key scenes in the movie that we were planning to shoot but struggled to get to work because of the snowstorm but then we got that that day instead so it really shows that like you have to be able to adapt and quickly and really be ready to to shoot with no means at all just like natural light having a mic on the camera never met the person before never talked to the person before just go out and then like connect with that person and be natural in that and, and try to ask also for stuff. Uh, that's crucial. Uh, and I think that you also need to ask people to do things and don't be afraid of that. Like this was the first time that I met her and I hadn't talked to her. I had other people doing the research and pre-interviews with her. Uh, but still, like when I set out to do that, I knew that I wanted this certain scene. Uh, and I didn't know how to get it, but I knew that she was going to shoot or she was going to do something that would be that scene. But then as we got there, she just sat in the truck and I just realized that, okay, if we're going to get this scene. I need to ask her to actually do this. And that's something that is crucial to dare to ask, to ask her to actually go out of her way to do something. In this case, step out of the car and go out and freeze for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. 
unnecessary for her but crucial for the story you need to be able to ask those things uh, and I eventually did I, I, I'm hesitant to do it because you never know like what's the limit of how much much you can ask for of somebody that early uh, but I did and we got this perfect scene that we needed um, and that's like a key thing in general but for me it was just super evident that that's like something that you have to do um, another thing is like to just understand that everybody is so freaking unpredictable that you can't really control the story if you do docs like that's just the way it is you just need to learn to adapt to that uh, and what happened was that our main shooting day was just like running out, uh, out of our hands like we had a planned schedule and it just like two two hours was just nothing we had nothing done what we had though was that we started to see like she's doing this like preparation to get ready to actually shoot with us and that preparation was the thing that was the most crucial scene in terms of explaining the story yeah. like you might not get that lucky all the time but just being able to go with the flow and actually shoot what's happening even though like this is definitely not what you planned for it's definitely not what you uh, wanted to do but instead of like being angry and irritated and and all that that you can become from something like that just seeing the possibilities in that situation and creating something out of it in our case we created this fantastic scene which is probably the most important scene in the whole film because it explains the character it shows like uh, the essence of the story in just this morning where she's like trying to prepare uh, her work but in order for you to like see that you need to understand the story going in and knowing like what to focus on in a scene like that so for us it was just focusing on her struggling with something and and that struggling shows the whole story uh, but you really, really need to like go with the flow rather than try to stick to your plan that's crucial uh, yeah, that's just like what I learned from Iceland outside of the pocket camera um, But let me just talk a little bit about the pocket and then I'll get back to planning the production But let's see if we have some questions first um, Suggest the camera which is better f to travel film and fiction film also Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K Hands down, hands down Not even a question uh, how did the Pocket Cinema 4K hold up? I'm so freaking surprised how well it held up. Like I had zero issues with it. And imagine like being in this cold environment, it's snowstorm all the time. You always have issues if you don't have like expensive cameras. It has zero issues. It did not die. It did not have any... Uh, okay, I, you'll see that later. I made this homemade type of plastic solution for the stuff that I felt shouldn't get snow into it but other than that like that that I do all the time because I don't like the whole enclosing of a uh, like a rain protection thing because it just covers all the stuff that you want to access and you can't see anything it just becomes flimsy so I just do like custom tape with like a plastic clear plastic bag uh, but I'll show you that later uh, it looks ridiculous but it works like really good um, battery wise I was thinking because I, I would like looking back I would probably have been fine using the uh, like camera batteries that I have but instead of doing that I decided to do like I had this cheese plate let me just get it I'll show you If I can get the mic off. If you're looking after the stream, like when it's not live, I'm sorry.
Damn it. Okay, so uh, I was trying to get like a Ronin solution because uh, I bought a cable from DJI, but that one just is just like 7.5 volts. So that didn't work. I cut it off, tried to make it work. It turns out three cables. I don't know what to do with three. I just know what to do with two. So instead of ruining the camera, because you need like a dummy battery solution in order for that to work. And I didn't have that. So my solution, and this one I'm pretty happy with, is cheese plate, NATO rail uh, grip thing. And then... So easy. And then it's just D-tap, because these batteries are so freaking large and fine and still small that you just do deep tap into the, the camera. I had the cable package from Blackmagic. And then I had another one as well that I put on, um, which made this a solution for the monitor as well. I wouldn't have needed it, but I thought that it was just comfortable to have it. And the reason why this made sense is because I used it on an easy rig, so the weight was not an issue. It was actually a good thing to have more weight. So I just put this on and, and it worked like a charm. Uh, this was like one uh, time that I put this on. This lasted a whole day. Like one of these batteries lasted a whole day for the camera. So that can be good to know. Um, I had like one left at the end of the day and then I was shooting like all day. Uh, the monitor didn't take anything, so I could probably have skipped that. But since I was pla uh, like putting plastic around the thing, it was just more comfortable to have big batteries and not have to hassle with that. But that was like my my solution for the batteries. Um, yeah. So before talking, I'll, I'll probably get back to it. if if you ask me anything about the pocket, I'll probably get back to it. But let me like just run through like what I think is key things. It feels like this one would scratch. Hmm. Key things when you plan a production. Looks like it's fine. First stage in any production is to research. I'll just run through this really quickly and then I'll make like an in-depth thing of a couple of things that I think is more important than the other things. Like, so research phase is super crucial. Uh, it's important to conceptualize your topic to make it you know, something that's solid that, that you can work around. Uh, you need to develop a look for your film. You need to cast the film. The right person will make it so much easier. Uh, you need to select equipment like we did, like on one shoot it would be the Ursa, on another one it would be the Pocket, on another one it would be an Alexa. So it kind of depends on what type of shoot you're doing. Uh, you need to pack and test the equipment before going. I did a lot of tests with the Pocket just to make sure that this was the right camera. So I didn't want to go out using that camera without testing the ISOs, testing what format shooting and all that. I did that for a long time, it's also going to be like part of my uh, review and everything, but that whole process was super important to know what to shoot and how and like what you cannot do uh, with the camera. Uh, you also need to think about, and this is often off, uh, overlooked, but insurance, do you need that? What type of insurance? Uh, for instance, when we were in Turkey shooting, we needed a separate drone operator because you weren't allowed as a foreigner to shoot as a drone operator. Now we could shoot as a drone operator, but then we had an airport next to it. So we need to be like, okay, looking at the maps for that. Those things you also need to think about. Uh, do you need like location permits? Um, what production crew do you need? I love using like fixers. That's a journalist term, but it's usually somebody local that helps you out and is the connection to the place uh, and is like organizing things and often drives as well. That person is so freaking important and it makes your life so much easier. So if you can either afford or get somebody on board, do it. You will not regret it. Um, yeah, and then it's also important to prepare re release forms for a doc. Uh, 
uh, especially if you want to sell it you need release forms for anybody that is in the film um, yeah th so if you have that ready then it's much easier to just go up and ask people but I would ask afterwards most of the time rather than doing it as it happens because uh, it's just a hassle to do it like before it might destroy the situation and stuff um, also think about like do you pr need to prepare any props or anything that you need in a scene for instance um, you also need to make a travel plan uh, and a call sheet for the production call sheet is when you like list all the people and the phone numbers like contact stuff and the call times call time is like when should this person or these people be at set for instance make a schedule like that uh, you need to schedule the interviews and the shooting of the scenes but then you need to sit down and talk and discuss with the characters so that you actually have a schedule that will work and not just be like wishful thinking because characters usually tend to just not be decisive at all um, yeah and then what backup plans do you need for what and why those are like the key things I'll talk a little bit about like some important things but let's see if we have some more questions here uh, have you thought about buying the Tilta base plate for Sony or V mount batteries I I bought the 8 sin half cage problem with the 8 sin is that um, it has a hard time balancing on the Ronin S so I would not buy that if you want to use a Ronin S I would go for a full cage because that little too much weight to the left is not a good thing with the pocket you really uh, have it pretty well balanced without it so it just screws up the whole thing uh, but in terms of the Tilta I'm gonna buy the Tilta with the focus wheel and the battery because that seems to be the perfect handheld solution you have the extra battery and you also have the focus wheel and that just makes a, such a big difference in a small package like that and I think that if you have that like even without it I think that it makes up for a better camera because the buttons are in really good places the only thing that annoyed me on the shoot is the function buttons on the top because I tend to always like touch them when I'm trying to like grip the camera in some way and like it's just annoying like you you turn on and off like false color or whatever you have programmed for it and that just uh, annoyed me but I don't know if that's like everybody but uh, if you have a cage that full cage I actually think that you save yourself from doing that because they will have like a, a little bit of uh, rise to them so you you won't be able to push push the buttons but you still will be able to lean your hand on the top of the camera so I thought first that would be a negative thing that you would have like to push down into the cage now I think that's a good thing um, yeah Uh, about festivals I still can't understand how this works um, you just paid for a screening of your film after that waiting for results like a secret to getting festivals is to ask for I don't know if everybody can but you can always ask the programmers for like a voucher I usually do that uh, or waiver is what they call it um, hi um da, 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 da. I like if you have a track record it's much easier <laughs> but I think most people can do it if you network as well so if you are meeting with programmers always ask for a waiver um, that's gonna make it free for you to send it to festivals that's what I would do but you really need to research the festivals and, and send to festivals where you think that your film fits and not just send it randomly that's what I would do but um, in general I think it's it's just the best way to get into a festival is to network with programmers because that's going to make it possible for you to go straight to them and get them to watch it rather than having like the assistant filtering it out before they even get their hands on it so they'll at least give it a chance even if you know it's amazing or sucks they'll give it a chance but they might just give it a couple of seconds I don't know depending on like the quality you need to think about the start of the film to hook them as well super crucial 
what's the best way to plan the story in pre-production? Uh, so I'm creating, so I'm not creating the story in post, which I find very time consuming. Yeah, I think, let me talk about that a little bit. First off, I think that research is crucial. I know I, I've talked about this so much, but it's essential. And the first step is really to research the topic that you're interested in to figure out like what is it about and why are you making it and like there's tons of things that you, you'll discover. Uh, you, usually I just go down like a Google rabbit hole on a topic that I'm interested in and then I'll see where it takes me. Like you want, might read articles, you might discover things that a friend on Facebook shares. All those things are relevant. And even like reading up on a subject, reading about everything on that topic or subject is, is something that leads you to like a deeper understanding and will lead you to the next like search term and, and all that. It's just about like going down that hole and trying to gather as much information as you can so that you'll make the right choices later. Um, and the more info you have, the more unique your story will be. That's crucial, I think, for anybody that wants to do something unique is to have all the information that the other ones are too lazy to actually go and seek out. So anybody that does uh, like something that's unique, I think that it usually comes down to them having more information and more experience with a topic that makes it like they're tired of the, the obvious way that everybody makes the story. And then they go about a different way and they shape a narrative from that background information that they have or deeper learning of a subject. Um, but also make sure that it's not something that you'll lose interest in because you don't want to be working on a project in like three or five years and then you just think it sucks when it goes out to festivals. Make sure that it's something that you're passionate about. That's going to make it easier as well. Uh, and also choose like a topic that you have the resources to actually seek out and go about creating so you don't do uh, stuff that is impossible because then you're just going to be stuck trying to make it forever. Uh, another thing is like when you conce conceptualize the topic, like think about what the purpose of the film is. Why do you want to make this doc? Uh, who's your target audience? It's super important to think about the target audience early on so that you make the film and shape like the look and feel and narrative and characters and all that from that. Uh, and also think about where is it going to be shown because if it's going to be shown on Netflix or a local channel it's going to be two totally different films. So if I make something for, for the Swedish public broadcaster if I want to sell something there you're going to have to make it to a Swedish angle if you want to better your chances of getting it in there. If you want to make something for Netflix, you're going to have to make something that's universal and, and like as a topic and, and story and visually is something that's uh, yeah, similar to what they do, which is usually like international and, and strong films that look amazing and has a cinematic language to them. So then you need to go about it that way. And, those things will dictate uh, depending on where you choose to show it. And think about the location as well, because that dictates a lot of things. Like if it's shot in Kino in Canada, or if it's shot in, in Turkey or Iceland, like all those things matter for the story, but also where it's going to be shown and where it's going to be funded, all those things. And also emotionally, like, look at the strongest angle that emotionally is going to affect this audience that you picked out um, to tell the story. Uh, those are like super important if you want to conceptualize what the film is about. Uh, and then once you have those two, like the research and you have the concept for the film, think about like developing a look for it and a style. Uh, all this should be done before you go out and shoot it. So if you, for instance, look at inspiration that you like, like pick your favorite films and, and stuff that you really like and then put together like a mood board with stills from those. Just do like screen dumps or something like that and capture the essence of what the look you're after. Uh, and then once you have that, you need to kind of pick the limitations that you're going to set out for yourself. Like for instance, for the dogma, 
limitations that the, the Danish pretty much had. Uh, it was mainly Danish they used it. They set out to use like DV cameras and it should not be intrusive and shouldn't affect the story. It was like super documentary, but it was fiction. Set those limitations, like decide on, okay, these focal lengths is what I'm going to use. Then you need to decide why you're using it as well. But uh, what apertures, like if you, for instance, shoot something in like everything 1.4 or 5.6, it's going to create a certain look. Uh, decide on uh, over or under exposure what type of look are you after and why like those questions should be asked early on for Kino we decided that we wanted to shoot most at like 18 to 35 and then like pretty much everything wide and cinema scope and and that sort of feel to it and if you decide that you're gonna compose the shots a certain way you're gonna think about it a certain way Everything was shot on an easy rig that also create a look to it uh, and then also create a LUT uh, that can kind of guide you how you want to light or not light a scene. Uh, but the most important thing for me a lot of the time is to think about how you want to move the camera as well. Do you want it to be like handheld? Do you want it to be all dolly or all gimbal? Those things you, you need to decide for yourself but if you want to like a real and authentic and immersive type of story, often the handheld look can kind of uh, help you with that, but it's often too rough to just go and just like do handheld. So I usually use the easy rig because it is like handheld, uh, kind of organic feel to it, but it is also very controlled and stable. So it's not even any weight on your shoulders, but you look kind of like a Robocop, but that doesn't really matter. You just want to make films, right? Um, but that's the thing that most... Uh, it's like a Swedish invention. So I, I'm guessing that it's predominantly Swedes that do it on a higher level. But I would guess that even other people do it. But I know that like the top DPs in Sweden uh, use that. And it's just so freaking good. It's so freaking good if you want handheld look but super controlled like a gimbal. Uh, then it's the perfect thing. So think about those type of like technical solution. And then like casting, for instance, you really need to figure out like what person you want to have in the film. Because the thing that I've learned the most, like from working on my different docs, is like first doc, just randomly like, oh, you're my friend, I'll shoot you. Now it turned out good, but I learned that I wanted to cast films a different way after doing it and then I tried to work with like Pearl of Africa I've, I've done other films as well but Pearl of Africa I wanted to seek out like a strong character that could work and I think after I did that I kind of figure out that it's it pretty much for me comes down to doing a lot of pre-interviews with the characters like casting is everything so you need to pick the right location you need to pick the right uh, conflict within the story, everything you need to think about in a visual way. How do you make this as strong and impactful as you can in the character's like daily life? So if you want to make a strong drama about something, think about the character and what it has in their lives already that you can build on. Think about the location in terms of like where they are and, and what their context is. How does this add to the story? Uh, and then do the pre-interviews to kind of figure out the narrative structure of your film and then build on that. Uh, we usually do like several like pre-interviews to figure out what we're shooting when we're going there. Uh, that's like one of the most important thing if you want to create a cinematic look is planning all that because you can't uh, control it once you get there. So like all the stuff that you do before is what dictates what you get pretty much. Uh, so if you want to create like a character with a cinematic feel to it or a story with a cinematic feel, you need to have that in their lives. Like the location, what does he or she do for work, how is that cinematic, like if, if it's a musician or if it's a drag racing or whatever it is, like those things, they will change your story completely depending on what they do. Uh, what hobbies do they have? Uh, what conflict is cinematic in their lives? It's really, really important to think about that. 
And once you have all that, the next step is pretty simple. It's just to make that shooting plan, create a scene list rather than a shot list, because the scene list will be more focused on what you need for the story. So it's going to be, for instance, uh, based on the conflict that you're trying to, to touch, you need to build a drama around that. Like you need to have a build up towards that conflict. You need to explain the conflict through real scenes that explains it by just you seeing the scenes. So if you think about it in that term, it's going to be something very different than if you do a shot list. If you think about things in, in like, okay, so this is the main conflict. These scenes would explain to the audience in a cinematic way what that conflict is and like build up the tension towards it. If you think about it that way, it's something very, very different and it's more emotionally impactful. Uh, so that's usually what I do. And, and then like you need to think about your budget. If you haven't thought about that or if you don't know much about budgeting, like look at the, I'll probably link it somewhere here later, but otherwise like the episode that we did for Kino on budgeting or, or how we messed up the budget. That one is probably a good elaboration on that. Um, make sure to take notes and rewrite all the time as you go on shoots. Like always rethink everything. Always be like changing things to fit more and better together. Like always think what the story is missing. So if we look at the Iceland film that we did now, uh, on the last day we had a plan. Like first we had a plan and then we had a different plan and then we probably have a different plan. But eventually we had a plan going into the last day. And as we were shooting, I kind of realized first in the night, I realized that, okay, we need like lighter th scenes with the main characters. So she becomes even more likable. And then we thought about like, what can we do in terms of these scenes and, and all that. And eventually you stand there and you're trying to capture it and, and you're trying to capture like the laughters or whatever it is that you're after. And then you try to like start those scenes that can make that happen. For us, it was like her with her family and that sort of scenes. And it's pretty simple, but that was the thing that we thought was the most impactful in terms of, of the story. Uh, but it, it's also about like seeing, okay, so she was really, really tired. So then you really, really need to think about how much you can push the person. And being with the family is also a choice that makes it like simpler for her to actually be smiling. So there is a lot of complexity. If you, if you are directing the way that I direct is, uh, which is like from far, like I kind of nudge people in a direction in life and then I try to capture that. I'm not the type of person that will say like, do this, do this. Uh, and if you are that type of director, you really need to always be reevaluating what the stuff is that you're trying to capture and why, and then like stri strike the scenes out. We had like a window in the morning, for instance, where we're just waiting and waiting for us to start the day. And I was just like, okay, so it actually looks clear right now. This is the first time in our whole time here that it's cleared out. So we can actually do the drone now. Let's just go and, and make it happen. And then we just went, we left our driver behind and then we just went and then we got one drone shot and then uh, Andre went to pick him up and then they came back and then we organized like the truck drone shots that we needed. But that means that we also in that decision pushed everything else because we pushed everything aside because it was that little window. But you really need to be on your feet and be like reactive to those things. Um, yeah, and then like just make a preliminary production schedule and, and then do like I do, restructure it as you go along. It's super important. Uh, and I usually write some questions and, and uh, dramaturgy to my questions beforehand, but I don't like to write the interview until I've met the person and be, like I've talked to the person and, and trying to like figure out the story. So for this, Iceland trip, I actually wrote the questions very late, like on the day that the interview was being made because we had so little time. So I knew the story in and out, so it was not that hard to do it. But I think those things make it more relevant and it makes it more like in phase with what you've captured in terms of scenes as well. 
Okay, so let's see what questions we got here. What batteries are those? These are the Sony. What are they called? Because these are no, these are the same ones. S8U93. I think they're called that. Like these are really good Vlox. So hard. Uh, I used these for the Westcott light as well. So I, I used this um, on a boom with the Westcott uh, one by ones flex light to boom the light. Really good. These are just more compact than the Vlogs. I don't like the Vlogs to travel with them. These are really, really powerful. I think these are 86 watt hours. So it's very much for like this size. Uh, I just prefer those over Vlox. So I just want these on like a grip type of thing and that would be the perfect solution if I could choose. Uh, yeah, can recommend them definitely. Uh, what about creating the story? At what point do you do that? Yeah, I pretty much like for the Iceland project, I wrote a whole storyboard and it's like our pitch decks are pretty much like 20 pages or something. So that's like developing the story. It's a lot of research. It takes a lot of time, but it's usually like putting together a whole uh, narrative and a visual theme and a look of the whole thing. And that's pretty different than when I do my own films. Like it's more loose when I do my own films, even though we had to sync me and Matt for Kino and, and talk about like, okay, these references and, and this was like the style that we were after. But in terms of like on location, we're pretty much in sync with what we're doing. And then it's just like shooting it. So it, it's not that big of a deal, but on a commercial commercial shoot, it's a bit different because everybody gets so freaking like worried about everything if you're not super clear about things so like showing them explaining how you think like it's super crucial to get them uh, to like understand what you're doing uh, it's pretty much like working with clients which you do like big commercial work 80 percent is the client work like actually babying the client 80%, 20% is pretty much the creative work and doing the project. Uh, and if you kind of understand that, then it becomes pretty uh, reasonable that you put in a lot of time into that pitch deck that's gonna explain everything and get everybody on board on your, your ID and everything. Um, but it is like a big hassle most of the time. This client we worked with a lot, so it's not the same, but when you work with somebody new, it's really like that. It's definitely 80%. But when you've also built the relationships, it's, it can be a little bit different. So for this, we wrote the storyboard. It was pretty much like super storyboarded with the narrative and everything, but then we say that everything can change. And everything did change, but in a good way, I think. It became like a stronger story. But the good thing with doing that is that you know that this is at least what you're going to bring home. Like this story, if we bring home this, we're satisfied. Now it's going to be better. And then like, we're super happy. But you need to really think about it in terms of like cutting the scenes and, and putting the narrative together. I'm going to break down this whole campaign, but unfortunately not until later. Uh, but I have other campaigns that we worked on that it's going to be uh, done in the same way. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. Mm, when you're preparing for a documentary, are you securing funding before you start? Do you ever start to shoot before uh, and hope the funding to come in? I prefer to just start shooting. Like that's like my, my way of doing it. I've always thought that is the best way to do it. And it's not that we can't get funding early on, but I think that it's really, really limiting to work with a funder at an early stage when you don't yourself know what you're doing. So we usually like to work like 
let's say we do like research we, we figure out what we're trying to do we do one shoot at least and do a trailer for that and then we figure out the story and write an application and that's when we try to get funding and for Kino that took it actually took I think about a year and a half before we did that and, but then we also did get the funding and now we're like that project is just going so I think most people that are successful invest a lot in the developing stage by themselves because it shapes the story and it like when you go to a funder they actually feel like this is something that's solid and it's not a gamble uh, I think the most uh, like the biggest thing is to actually understand that you're trying to just get their first impressions to just blow them away and it says it itself that like you're not going to do that with some text so you need a trailer pretty much you need all that stuff worked out you need a story arc and all that and once you have that it's much easier but it's not all about that it's also about the relationship with the funder that's a, a huge part of getting funding uh, okay how much ram do you use for fusion i find 16 gigabytes f uh, struggle uh, yeah i use 16 i think it's fine for me like i don't have any issues but you really need fast drives for it to work i think like b resolve in general you need fast drives i have a raid that's really fast and then i have ssds and that works pretty well but most of the time uh which gimbal world explorer which gimbal is the best for video making like it totally depends on what you're trying to do but for me i had the ronin m and i thought that was not the the gimbal for me it was too uh, i don't know it was too clumsy to get the shots i prefer just having the easy rig so that gimbal i didn't like I, in general i don't like gimbals over the easy rig like for this shoot for instance in iceland i shot with the gimbal the first day because i didn't have time to set up the whole rig that it takes for the for the uh, for using it on the easy rig but from that point on i shot everything on the easy rig and i just prefer the easy rig so much to the gimbals it has to do with the weight it has to do with like it being almost as good as a gimbal in terms of of motion but it also has like a a nerve in the organic feel to it that you get uh, because it's more handheld feel but it's not like jumpy handheld it's actually very controlled like a gimbal but a little bit more organic um, yeah so for me like I say gimbals are super overrated but I still have the Ronin S uh, and I like the Ronin S over the Ronin M any day I just like the small form factor and everything I think ironically because I've been like uh, bitching about the pocket not being a, a vlogging camera but that's how i see the ronin s and the pocket being used together most of the time for me uh, when i vlog i think that's going to be how i vlog when i do the youtube channel that's how i'm going to do it but when i film other people i think that it's not as useful um, certain shots like trick shots sure walking like if that's the look you're going for sure but most of the time I prefer the easy rig. Uh, are business cards really needed in 2018? No. But I mean, some people like to hand them out. Uh, I don't think that it's like I don't have business cards. I haven't had them for years. Um, but uh, you need to have a brand. You need to have something to lock into. Uh, and that's more important like business cards are not worth anything because everybody hands them out uh, I just think that if you have a brand then that's what's important and if you can focus on that then you'll win uh, is documentary filmmaking a labor of love or can mid-level doc filmmaker make a good living from it I think that most people that make a good living they do like commercial work that type of stuff <coughs> but I don't see that this is going to continue, that you can't do docs. 
for you to actually be able to work and make a living making docs you either need to do other stuff or you need to do several films at a time we're doing at the moment three or four projects at the same time and then like doing that it's fine you can do just docs that way and you don't work full time with one project at a time anyways so for us that's the sweet spot but we also do commercial work but we're in like a transitioning phase as well so we'll do less of that moving forward and more of like brand deals with the channel um, and then doing uh, our docs but if you do like public service projects then you can't really get like sponsorship deals and that sort of thing that we're doing for the kino film so then you need to work in a little bit different way but we look at this as like a way for us to build a platform around education as well so the more we work on this the more the, the educational platform learndocumentary.com uh, is going to grow and that's going to be like uh, a platform for us to actually uh, make a living through that platform by educating you guys as well so i think that you need to think about like different ways to make money and not just see it as like oh i sold my film to netflix oh i sold my film to tv that's not the way that you should think about it think about it in like different ways of of earning money from what you do but i would look to like musicians and that sort of thing um, how they make money they don't make any money from a cd or selling a song or anything but they have stuff that actually makes money that's how we see it at least um, but it's really hard to make money off of doing docs i don't think anybody does it um, even like the biggest directors that do commercials and stuff but when you do high profile docs you do get commercial work and people coming to you so that's the good thing about making your passion projects the more you get into the pr sphere and, and get exposure the more questions you're going to get people to ask you to do the same thing but for their brands and uh, even if you go into like the advertising world you need to win prizes there to be able to like explode in that world as well we're not so interested in that anymore but i think that most people that do want to uh, go that route really need to focus on like creating uh, consistent work that is or looks like at least hundred thousand dollars in terms of the production because then you will get hundred thousand dollar productions uh, yeah but dock work it's a labor of love but you can make a living out of it it's just very complicated um, okay so I don't know how you pronounce this. Kianoop or K1 Anoop. <clears throat> what would you recommend for shooting various stuff as a one man band shoestring budget for a combat sports mini documentary? Uh, all in one day, including training, interviews, and fly on the wall conversations and other stuff generally happening happening in what can be a busy gym environment for capturing the best possible visual audio footage but without adding lighting and a plug-in mic only. Thank you in advance. Okay, so <laughs> first I would think about, can you shoot it in more days? It makes such a difference. Like I was just talking to Andre now, because we shot this doc in three days. We uh, were supposed to shoot it in two days in Iceland. Three days made, made it work. Like it, it, it's gonna be fine. If we would have had four days, it would have been freaking amazing. I don't know, maybe it's going to be, but that's going to be like cut in the editing room. If we had that little bit of more time, you will be able to make a couple of shots and stuff that you can take your time and get like super cinematic. When you have that rush, you don't have that time. So I would think about that first. But then I would switch location a lot. Like don't spend time in the same location or same angles. Like switch, switch, switch. That's how you make it feel more expensive and, and like it gets more production value. Uh, simplify things as well. So do minimal travel 
for instance, we had for yeah, Iceland a, a trip that would take us like an hour and in total maybe five hours just to get a couple of shots. And then like we rerouted that whole thing. So it took like 10 minutes instead and was really close to the city just because of the logistics of everything. It did not make sense to go that far to get the shots. Uh, think about that and, and like make minimal changes, but make it look like a big change. Uh, think about the story and without interview, like don't think about the interview at all. Think about story in terms of how do you tell this story without somebody telling the story. Just let the story unfold as it is and let like life unfold and then capture that in a cinematic way. And you'll have a much stronger film that the interview then can add to, but don't base it around the interview because that's just gonna make it so freaking boring and, and uncinematic. Um, and record also sound, I think, for all the details. Like if you're in an, uh, a combat sports environment, then record all the punching and all those things uh, on your camera or on a separate recorder. Uh, not as you shoot, but separately to get those big sounds that you need to sound design the thing. And that brings me to like sound design. Really work on the sound design and don't overuse music because that just makes it like feel repetitive and it loses tempo and everything. But when you work with the sound design and make that epic, then it totally immerses the audience in a different way. Uh, and also look at references, like I said, about the mood boards really work on mood boards and get it to create a style before you go on the shoot. Uh, and if you want to use audio, I would say like if you want to record audio, record it maximum half a meter away from what you're trying to record. Don't go any further than that. It's just practical thinking. Yeah, that's my advice for that. Um, okay, so Last question, let me see. Okay, so two questions. When shooting people walking around and talking, what's the best way to mic that? Great talk, by the way. I would say, thank you first. And then I would say, uh, lavaliers are amazing for getting that sound and not feel like limited. I usually, use one mic on the camera it's usually a sennheiser 416 but when i couldn't afford that it was a sennheiser mke 600 or something it's a bit cheaper but it's still a good solid mic um i think that's what it's called but then the electrosonics pdrs with the sanken cost on the people would do it you also have cheaper versions that are like tascam has one and you also can do like radio mics if, if you like that but I just think wireless sucks and is unpredictable so I wouldn't recommend it to anybody uh, I would say like if you have the lab you always have the person so you can move around freely with the camera and get the shots that are the best shots and not depending on the audio because if you have an on camera mic you really want to be close to the subject like as close as I am now touching you guys that's even a bit too far you should probably be about here and that would be pretty pretty close right so, so if you think about like audio in that sense i think it's it's pretty straightforward but for the doctor we did now i think everything is in camera uh, in iceland that's just like practical because of like syncing time and all that it's uh, we wouldn't have had to do it but we have like a short turnaround Ironically, we have a short turnaround, but the film is not going to come out until <laughs> the end of 2019. But yeah, that's the plan and we stick to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, when, okay, so last questions. When you do a pre-shoot for developing the story and the trailer for funding, how much of the story are you trying to tell? What are the main features you're trying to show off? So a couple of things, you really want to think about the character in itself, like to create a strong character portrait. So people need to understand why this is such a fantastic person that you're following. Why is this an amazing character? That's very important. 
Another thing is to focus on like the main conflict and to show that. So that's pretty easy. If you have a main conflict and you just try to figure out the scenes that can show that uh, in the best cinematic way. Uh, and then uh, other than that, I think those are the, like the main things, but also think about the cinematic language and to capture that as, you, as good as you can, because you want it to look like the film as much as you can. Uh, and then like you're probably gonna re make that later but still like it's gonna be a fragment of what the finished product will be like uh, yeah so I'm gonna do this as the last question sorry question with no topic but do you have a Vimeo with your commercial work I actually don't I should though but I don't try to get commercial work I'm trying to get out of it so we just keep with what we have and, and that's that okay so let me know if you want to do anything more around this like shooting planning that sort of thing and i'll, I'll make something on that later but i'm doing like a b-roll type of video right now what do you want to know about b-roll let me know and i might be able to add it to the video this week okay so see you guys bye bye